All right, good afternoon. Um, I'm Benjamin Gilbert. I'm a software engineer working on Fedora Core OS. I also still work a little bit on Core OS Container Linux. Test? Test? Can you hear me? Yeah. Oh, you can hear me. Uh, I'm Jonathan. Uh, I work with Benjamin also on uh, Fedora Core OS. Cool. Just to advance. Try this guy. Interesting. Oh, we've got two simultaneous copies of this going on, so it's... Yeah, there you go. Sorry, let me play with this for one sec. Because otherwise we're not going to see what's going on. Oh, I see. It's only moving. Sorry about that. Okay, so what is Fedora Core OS? Uh, it is a new edition of Fedora that is uh, that we're building specifically for running containerized workloads at scale. Um, if you've heard of Core OS Container Linux, uh, this dates from uh, Core OS Incorporated, which Red Hat acquired uh, what a couple years ago now. Uh, and Container Linux has been pursuing a similar model for several years. Uh, it's a small integrated OS specifically for running containers. Um, so we're continuing that uh, sort of model plus integrating technology from Fedora Atomic Host. Um, here's the mission statement. I won't, uh, but I think there are a couple uh, elements that are important here. Um, Fedora Core OS is targeting several different sort of workloads in this space, or um, use cases in this space. Um, it is targeted at clusters, but it does not necessarily require running in a cluster. And um, obviously, we're interested in running uh, in the Kubernetes ecosystem, but we're not going to require that either. It's also possible to use Fedora Core OS to run containers of standalone. Um, you may have heard of RHEL Core OS. So what is the relationship between these operating systems? RHEL Core OS is uh, specifically intended as a component of OpenShift. It updates along with OpenShift. It's versioned along with OpenShift. Um, it is based on the Red Hat Enterprise Linux package set. So there's not actually a separate SKU, as we say. You can't uh, download and use RHEL Core OS as a standalone operating system. It's something that's just integrated into OpenShift, and you shouldn't have to think about it. Fedora Core OS is targeting a slightly broader set of use cases. Uh, it shares some of the components in tooling. It shares a lot of the same people working on it. Uh, but it is standalone. Uh, as I said, it's targeting a slightly uh, broader set of use cases, and it's based on the Fedora package set. Um, so there are a few elements uh, that's important to understand about how we think about actually both of these operating systems, Fedora and RHEL Core OS. Um, and the key one is immutable infrastructure. Uh, these, are, these philosophical elements are not things that are um, embodied in code exactly, um, but they affect how we design the operating system and how we uh, want it to be used. So immutable infrastructure. Um, the idea here is that You'll need to make some customizations to, to your operating system, right? You might need to set the host name, um, configure static IP addresses, um, configure your container runtime. Um, and the idea is that all of those customizations should be encoded in a single file, which is the provisioning config. Uh, and then that provisioning config is given to the node when it first starts, and it applies all of the configuration. After that, um, we think that you shouldn't go in further to configure the node. Uh, you can SSH to the node and change things. Uh, you can uh, use configuration management tools if you'd like. We, we don't stop you. Uh, but the problem is that then your provisioning config gets out of sync with the actual state of the node. So what we think you should do instead is uh, change the provisioning config and spin up a new node using it and then tear down the old node. Um, so essentially, once a, a node exists, you treat it as immutable. And the reason for that is then if you want to scale out um, due to changes in, in uh, demand, then you can just launch new nodes with your current config and not have to think about uh, configuration per se. Uh, 
so another philosophical component is uh, that software should run in containers. The operating system is for supporting hardware. It's for providing the container runtimes. Uh, but if you're running your own software on the node, it should always be in a container. Toward that end, we don't ship interpreters. We have Bash, obviously. Um, and Auken said, if you count those, we don't ship Python. We don't ship Perl. We don't ship Ruby. Um, if you want those things, run them in a container. Similarly, um, ABI compatibility for libraries within the host is not something we worry about too much. The operating system is self-consistent, but uh, if you copy some random uh, binary onto the node, it's not guaranteed to keep working uh, over an OS upgrade. And speaking of OS upgrades, OS versions themselves are an implementation detail. Um, think of the node as something like an appliance. Um, it should auto update, update itself. I'll talk about that more later. Uh, but really, you shouldn't have to think about it. And in particular, uh, when a Fedora major version upgrade occurs, if you go from Fedora 30 to 31 to 32, uh, that should just be a regular upgrade. You shouldn't have to think about, about that at all. Um, OK, so what does this operating system look like in a little bit more detail? It's targeted at uh, cloud instances and bare metal servers. Uh, we aim to have it available on a wide variety of clouds, um, all of the usual suspects, really. Um, workloads, as I said, should run in containers, which means that the operating system image itself can be pretty minimal. There's not a lot in it. Um, it's an image-based distro. So you're not running DNF. You're not installing RPMs. Uh, you get essentially a monolithic file system image, uh, and then it is updated atomically. So if you've heard of RPM OS tree, uh, it is, you can think of it a little bit like Git for the operating system. You, uh, you have some revision, and then when an update comes along, uh, you pull that down and apply it atomically to the disk and reboot into it. Uh, so you're never running in sort of a half-upgraded state the way you might be with DNF. Uh, on top of RPM OS tree, we add automatic updates. So RPM OS tree, uh, by default, will upgrade when you tell it to. Same as DNF. Um, we are adding a system on top of that which uh, automatically fetches and installs updates. And again, we'll talk about that a little bit more later. So specifically, uh, what clouds? Um, the targets that we're, uh, that we're focused on right now are listed there. That also includes uh, virtualization systems like QMU. Um, one note, though, uh, some clouds Often you'll find if you launch um, in, let's say, GCP or Azure, um, many Linux operating systems will include those clouds agent. Uh, the agent does different things depending on the cloud. Um, on some platforms, uh, it has to check in with the cloud before the cloud believes that the OS is booted successfully, for example. Uh, sometimes it provides additional management functionality so that from the, the cloud's uh, web interface, you can um, add users to, to the node, or uh, maybe even run code on the node. Um, in general, we are going to try to avoid shipping those platform agents. Um, a lot of the functionality is not all that meaningful for a, a sort of more specialized operating system like Fedora CoreOS. And um, not all of that code is uniformly well advised. And so um, what we are generally trying to do, uh, we have a piece of code called Afterburn. And it is sort of a generic, minimal cloud agent. So on those platforms where you have to do something special to get network configuration or host name or, uh, or to tell the cloud that you're ready, uh, Afterburn will do that. And we'll use that instead of the cloud agents. On the bare metal side, um, it's pretty much what you'd expect. You install the operating system to disk and run it, uh, except for one thing. In some sense, Fedora CoreOS is a, a cloud-native or cloud-first operating system. And in the cloud, you don't have an installer. There's nothing like Anaconda. Uh, you're just launching a, a prepackaged image. And so bare metal for, for Fedora CoreOS doesn't have a, an installer either. What we do instead is essentially a shell script. Uh, you run a thing, and it fetches a, a monolithic bag of bits and effectively just DDs them to disk. Um, with consequences I'll get to in a minute. 
Uh, but the idea is that the install process should be as simple as possible. Um, one other note, Container Linux supports uh, live Pixie. So you can um, essentially just run your entire production OS from RAM and never install to disk at all. We're going to have similar functionality for Fedora Core OS. This is actually fairly widely used on Container Linux as a way to um, even further minimize the footprint of the operating system on disk. So, uh, what is in Fedora Core OS? Uh, so, of course, it has all the latest uh, Fedora updates, you know, System D, kernel. Uh, it's not based on Gen 2. Um, we have all the basic hardware enablement software uh, that we need. Uh, there's basic administration tools. Like Benjamin was saying, you know, we don't expect you to log into Fedora Core OS that much to play around with it because everything should be uh, set up for right from the beginning with your uh, ignition config or from the provisioning step. We'll talk about ignition uh, after. Uh, but we have SSH, of course. There's rsync, tar, all the basic stuff. Uh, you can check the journal uh, to do like some basic debugging and stuff. Uh, of course, there's container engines. So we have Podman, Moby, and System DN spawn. And then uh, we're still uh, discussing how we'll uh, provide the kubelet and cryo to nodes. So uh, watch out for more discussions about that. Uh, okay, so how do you actually provision a Fedora Core OS node? Uh, so Fedora Core OS uses this tool called Ignition. Uh, Ignition is very similar to in in idea to uh, Cloud Init for those of you who are familiar with uh, how Fedora Atomic Host was provisioned. Uh, so Ignition takes in a configuration file. Uh, this file is a JSON document and is provided using whatever the user data mechanism is for the platform you're targeting. So you know, in, uh, in most clouds, you can pass in uh, uh, some user data. Uh, so what can Ignition do? Uh, you know, you can write files, you can write systemd units, uh, you can create users and groups. But then you can also do fancier stuff, uh, like partition the disks, uh, create RAID arrays, uh, you can format file systems. So for those of you coming from, like, the, the RHEL Fedora side, this, it, it's, sort of, it's sort of a mix between cloud init and kickstart. Right, so, and that's part of the reason why, um, as Benjamin was saying, the bare metal image and the cloud image are actually the same thing. Uh, Ignition is sort of doing, taking, taking the place of, of kickstart and, and cloud in it almost. Um, so, uh, the reason why we can do those kind of powerful manipulations is because Ignition runs in the init ramifest, so it runs even before the system is really booting. Uh, it runs exactly once. And most importantly, if anything fails during the provisioning steps, if, any, if anything in the config can't be uh, executed, uh, it'll fail to boot. So that means that if your node came up, you're pretty confident that your configuration has been obeyed. Okay, so how do you write an, an, an ignition config? So like I said, configs, the configs are in JSON. It's super mechanical. Uh, it's not that pretty. It's untriggered. Uh, so we have this sort of layer on top called uh, the Fedora Core OS config language. So this, it's, this one is meant for humans. Uh, it's in YAML. Uh, so it mostly maps onto the ignition config, but it has some additional uh, sugar for things like, you know, if you want to set your time zone or if you want to set, like, whenever uh, uh, update windows for when, you, when your nodes should update, uh, things that the... the uh, Fedora Core OS config transpiler uh, will convert into things that Ignition understands. Uh, I sort of jumped the gun because the next bullet actually explains what the transpiler is. The transpiler is uh, the thing that converts the YAML into JSON. So it converts the Fedora Core OS config uh, file into uh, the Ignition config uh, JSON that Ignition actually understands. And it's actually, it's actually also, uh, it gives you a chance to uh, be stopped by uh, the transpiler before you actually bring up the node if there's a really obvious error in your ignition config so that you don't find out whenever when you're booting your node in AWS, oh, I missed a uh, closing bracket here. Uh, I have to reprovision the node. Um, okay, automatic updates. So this is basically uh, one of the you know key features of Fedora Core OS. Uh, it's 
inherited from the container Linux uh, philosophy of automatic updates. And the basic idea is users should not have to think about updates at all, right? The machine should just take care of updating itself. It should be able to just pull in the latest uh, bug fixes, the latest security patches. Um, a consequence of that, uh, if we really want this to work, is that we need automatic updates to be rock solid. We need it to be super reliable. Because if it's not reliable, users will just turn them off. And if users turn, turn them off, they don't get the latest fixes. They don't get the latest uh, security patches. So uh, that basically means we can't have any breaking changes. And if we do envision any sort of breaking change, we need to have a really long deprecation window that we publicize widely. Um, so how do we make sure that we don't break changes? Uh, we don't introduce breaking changes. So a lot of CI, you know, obviously, if the build doesn't pass CI, it's never going to make it to the users. Uh, but then we also have some sort of process level uh, mechanisms. So uh, Benjamin uh, after is going to talk about uh, managed update rollouts and uh, the different release streams that we have with, with different semantics around uh, breaking changes. And then uh, finally, we have automatic rollbacks. So uh, the node is capable of, uh, let's say, pulls down the update. It boosts, it reboots into the new update. And if there's, if there's something wrong with that new update, uh, for example, some service doesn't come up, it'll detect that and it'll roll back to the previous update, uh, the previous uh, uh, version that it was on. Uh, uh, this also includes the ability for users to specify uh, additional checks that the uh, boot has to pass before it's considered a successful boot. So you can imagine if in your scenario you can have like a service that you really need to be uh, up and if that service is not up, even if everything else is working, you, it's just you don't want it to to uh, propagate across your fleet. Okay, so I'm going to do a demo now of the, I guess the provisioning workflow and also the uh, automatic updates. Oh, this is going to be interesting, actually, because I can't see. Let me see if I can mirror. <laughs> I guess we'll revert the settings. Is it not? It's just dead now, isn't it? Okay, fun. Let me try something here. I'm just trying to make it mirror. Oh, oh, there we there go. You, go. Uh, you can go ahead, though. Uh, I'm a little confused. So you talked about the uh, immutability of the nodes, but then you also talked about um, kind of bringing up a parallel system. Yeah, sure. Uh, you talked about the, uh, the immutability. You can't change the nodes once they're up. <laughs> <laughs> we also talked about having updates and a, and a live reboot system. And I just, I, right. those were kind of, I didn't quite understand how that worked. Right. Uh, we think of the system as immutable from the perspective of the config. So the user, again, is free to change configs of things, but probably shouldn't. The node itself will continue to update. Uh, so it's not truly immutable in the sense that it's a fixed bag of bits that never changes. It's just that. Um, we don't want the user poking around at the system after it's set up. Cool. Can everyone read the font okay? Okay. So <clears throat> so this is a Fedora Core OS uh, config. Uh, so it's YAML. Uh, so I won't go through every field, but basically we're telling, uh, we want our config to uh, create a uh, user, a core user, and uh, we want it to have a specific uh, SSH key uh, as an authorized key. And then uh, we also wanted to write out a systemd unit file. So now uh, we have this YAML file and we'll convert it to, actually let me bring that up, right. We'll convert it to uh, the Ignition JSON. So to do that you use uh, this tool called the Fedora Core OS Config Transpiler, uh, shortened to FCCT. And actually I'll just use my bash history here. 
Uh, so you give it a YAML file. This is the file that we had just opened. And then the, we want to output to JSON. Enter. And I'll just show you quickly what that looks like. But uh, So essentially the same information is there just in, in JSON. But in the future you can imagine more complex uh, things in the YAML that gets translated to many more things in the Ignition config. Uh, okay, so let's boot up a machine with this uh, config. So actually, I'm going to boot up two machines. Uh, one, one is going to be on the previous uh, version of uh, uh, Fedora Core OS, and the other one will be on the latest version of Fedora Core OS. And the reason I do that is the one that's going to be booted on the previous version uh, will be for demoing automatic updates, uh, but for the purposes of uh, provisioning with an, with an ignition config, I'm just going to use the latest AMI. Because you should always be using the latest config normally. You wouldn't have a reason to use the previous one. Or the latest AMI, sorry. Uh, so, far. so, okay, this is a lot of goop. But essentially, uh, the key part here is, you know, we do AWS EC2 run instances. And right here, the user data, that's where we're passing the ignition config to, um, to the cloud. Uh, so let's run that. Hopefully, conference Wi-Fi is on our side. Okay, cool. Okay, so I provisioned two uh, two instances. So the second one is the latest AMI. So I'm just going to fetch the IP for that. Uh, actually. So remember, the uh, ignition config basically had uh, the authorized keys that we wanted to add and a systemd unit file, just a dummy foobar unit. Okay, that's fun. Might have to wait a little bit more. Uh, let's, let's let me just double check here. 380, 140, 187. Okay. Okay, so we're in. So the fact that we logged in, that means that the SSH uh, uh, config went in. And then let's check our systemd service. Okay, our bar has been food. Very cool. So now, let's try a... Uh, let's look at automatic updates. So I'm going to log into the, uh, the second instance that I booted up, which was actually... Um, the the older version uh, so it's this one uh, okay so this is interesting actually Okay, so right now it's on the uh, previous version. Uh, so I didn't actually show you the RPM history status of the other node that I booted up, but um, it was on uh, 0801, and this is one. This one is on 0725. So it should be in the process of updating, and we can check that by uh, looking at the status, the journal entries for. Zincati and RPM history. So Zincati is a service that actually checks for updates, and when it finds an update, it'll uh, tell RPM history, okay, upgrade to this latest update. Ah, that's what happened. Okay. Fail to query Cincinnati. Or, okay, so Zincati will retry in five minutes. Um, do we have that luxury? Well, what I can do is... Sure. Okay, so now um, Zincati detected a, uh, a new update and then it's telling our parameter deploy um, this new uh, commit. And now our parameter 
has deployed it, and now the node is rebooting. Yeah, so what just happened there was that uh, we start the update client without respect to whether networking is already up. Because if the first attempt to check in fails, try again in five minutes, it's fine. But of course, right. for a demo, it's not so fine. Yeah, let's see how quickly AWS nodes reboot. What's funny is when I tested this earlier, it honestly reboots fine within the first like two or three minutes. It doesn't hit that race condition, but the one time you do it live, you know. Okay, so there's already a good sign here, which is in the uh, login uh, prompt thing. It already tells you the latest, the version you're on, and this this is the latest version. So we know the upgrade went well. And if you do an RPM with your status, you can see that it. It's in the new deployment. So if you're not familiar with RPM OS 3, it's, this is basically saying, I was in this previous version in 0.7.25, and now I'm, now I'm in this version, 0 0.8.01. And let's go back to the presentation. Cool. It's mirrored now. So. Yeah, cool. OK. Um, we do a couple interesting things uh, with respect to how we publish install images and upgrades. Uh, so as I mentioned before, uh, when you install Fedora Core OS, you're essentially just fetching a monolithic set of bits and, and copying them directly to your disk. Um, in many Linux distros, you can go to some FTP or, or web server somewhere and browse around and see all of the release images. We intentionally do not enable that for Fedora Core OS. Um, the, the older release artifacts are still there, uh, but we think it's important to exercise uh, closer attention to which images are being published. Uh, so the starting point, if you want some Fedora Core OS bits, um, is a JSON document at a public endpoint. And if I, it's highly nested, so I didn't put it in the slides, but um, if you look at that JSON document, you index by... Uh, the CPU or architecture you want, uh, the platform you want, such as AWS or GCP, and then uh, perhaps even the, the region of AWS that you want. And when you, when you get down through all those levels of, of nesting, what you get at the end is, okay, here's the Fedora Core S version, um, here's the perhaps cloud image ID, or here's the URL to the download you want. Uh, and the idea is that if you have scripts, for example, that fetch a, a QM image and deploy it to your, to your machines, um, those scripts start with the release meta, uh, sorry, the stream metadata, and always know what our recommendation is for the OS version to run. Um, in fact, the, the download site, which is just a you know, traditional download web page on getfedora.org, um, reads the same JSON document. Uh, so the idea here is that if we put out a bad release for some reason and then we find out about it, someone files a bug or, or whatever, um, we can stop uh, new deployments from using that release because we'll point the stream metadata back to a known good release. So this always rec represents our recommendation for what's the safe release to run. Um, on the update side, we have something similar. So you saw it in Caddy just now. Um, it, before uh, performing an update, it checks in with a service run in Fedora infrastructure, which gives it permission to update and tells it, um, essentially, here are the, the versions you can update to. Uh, that lets us roll updates out gradually. Container Linux did the same thing. Um, when Zenkati checks in, it picks a number between 0 and 1, and it says, I'm, I'm interested in being this aggressive uh, for this rollout. And... Uh, you know, if I'm a client and I say I'm, inter I'm uh, my aggression is 0.4, and uh, the server says I'm only rolling out releases to 0.3 and below, uh, then then I won't get that update yet. I won't even be told it exists. So what that lets us do is just roll out releases gradually over time, and that means that if someone reports a regression to us or we find out about it in some way, we can stop the rollout uh, without having blatted this update to however many, to the entire fleet of nodes. 
Um, and other things NCADI can do, so that's, that's sort of a, a distro-wide piece of functionality. But individual nodes, individual clusters can also be configured to have their own services that they check into. Um, so if you're running a cluster, you probably want to make sure that every node in that cluster doesn't update at the same time. And the way you can do that is have Zencaddy um, call a service in your cluster and say, may I update now? And that service can make sure that it gives permission to exactly one node at a time or two. Uh, maybe it only gives out permission in the middle of the night, whatever it is you want to do. Um, we will provide uh, at least one implementation of an example service, or you can, you can provide your own. Release streams. Um, Jonathan mentioned uh, automated CI before. CI is good, it can't catch everything. We are shipping the Linux kernel, we are shipping systemd, we are shipping multiple container runtimes. Uh, that's a lot of code being uh, written by a lot of people, and CI is just not going to catch all of the, the interesting bugs. So um, when we roll out a release, we want to be able to do it in a way that users can test it on, with their workloads, with their network configurations, um, on their hardware, and let us know if there are problems before it hits the entire fleet. So the way we do that is um, any, we start with Fedora 30 right now, uh, plus the set of, of update packages. And every two weeks we snapshot that. And we make a release on the testing stream. And the idea is, um, Users, we would encourage to run a few percent of their nodes on testing, report problems to us. Um, after two weeks, we take that testing release and we maybe make whatever fixes are necessary, add security fixes, whatever, and roll it out to the stable stream. And that will be rolled out over time to everybody. Um, we also have the stream next, which uh, is intended to give extra baking time for longer changes. So for certain types of things, uh, a two-week test period is probably not enough. That's things like um, new uh, substantial kernel releases, um, Fedora 31 as a whole. And so uh, those sorts of things will be on the next stream for longer uh, to get more time to get feedback. Um, as it says, uh, we hope users run a little bit of testing, a little bit of next in production, next to their stable nodes. Uh, and in order to make that work, we will apply critical bug fixes and security fixes to all three streams. So you're not in a situation where I'm running next and that's fine, but there's this un unfixed security vulnerability. Um, one other thing that's interesting that we're doing is we're enabling machine counting by default. Um, there's a, there's a trade-off here. One of the things that we found um, with Container Linux, with Fedora Atomic Host, Fedora as a whole, in fact, it's very difficult to focus development time if you don't know how many users you have and what they're doing. Um, so for Fedora Core OS, do we spend more time on AWS? Do we spend more time on DigitalOcean or Packet, making those platforms better, that kind of thing? On the other hand, privacy is important. This is, this is free software. Uh, people don't want their machines spying on them, and we understand that. That is very important to us as well. So um, we're, we're trying to strike a balance here. Uh, by default, Fedora Core OS will report um, some sort of generic information about nodes that are running. And by what I really mean, non-identifying information. So this is things like, I'm running on AWS. I'm running an M4 large instance type. Um, my OS version is X. The original installed version of the OS version was Y. These are things that hopefully are uh, apply to enough people that uh, it shouldn't fingerprint a node. Um, if you want, you'll be able to opt into additional to reporting additional information. Like if you're on bare metal, um, what type of machine you have. There's probably fewer of those, so it might theoretically fingerprint you. Or, of course, it will always be possible to completely opt out of this reporting. Um, the key point here is we will not, we will only look at this information in aggregate. We will not look at individual records, and no unique identifiers will be reported at all. Um, the way this effectively works is that once a day, the node says, oh, I need to report in and, and give this information, but there's no unique IDs. Um, we feel that it's important to have this on by default because otherwise we won't get an accurate sample. 
Um, but you know, hopefully we're, we're preserving the, the privacy properties that we want to be preserving here. Um, and we will carefully document in the getting starting guide and everything else um, that this is going on. Okay, so how do we actually build uh, for a core OS? Uh, so actually this is shared with uh, Red Hat core OS. Uh, the main tool is core OS assembler. So it's sort of this collection of capabilities that together make it really, really easy to uh, build for OS uh, locally. Uh, so it's both used for developers, for development purposes, and for uh, production. So it's essentially just with three steps you can build Fedora Core OS locally. Uh, you do COSA in it, and then you give it the uh, this repo. So that Fedora Core OS config repo is where all the definition files for uh, what goes into Fedora Core OS uh, live. So you know all the packages. Uh, and then soon we'll have lock files, so actually specifically what version of each package we want in, in there. Um, and then fetch fetches the packages and build will build it, of course. Uh, so a cool thing about Core Assembler is it can run fully unprivileged. Um, so under the hood, it uses RPM OS3, of course, to convert the RPMs into uh, an OS3. And then uh, Supermin. So Supermin is both used for doing the unprivileged stuff, but also for actually uh, creating the disk images that become the cloud or, or the bare metal images. Uh, a big difference between Fedora Core OS and Red Hat Core OS compared to, let's say, the rest of uh, our traditional Fedora is it does not use Anaconda to build images. Uh, so there's various reasons for this, but um, yeah, the idea here is, like I said earlier, right? We have ignition is sort of the only tool we want to have to uh, specify how you want your machine provisioned. Uh, so, how do we actually run Fedora Core, uh, the Core Assembler in uh, production to build the production images? Is a Fedora Core S pipeline. Uh, so it's simply a Jenkins pipeline that will run Core S Assembler in OpenShift. So everything happens in OpenShift, and then. Uh, we push those out to um, to the uh, to S3. Okay, so where are we now? Um, there is a preview release of Fedora Core S available today. Um, it's not ready to run in production, so please don't. Uh, what we'd like people to do is try it out, report bugs to us, report missing features. Um, be aware that we're reserving the right to make uh, backward incompatible changes during the preview period uh, in order to uh, fix things. Uh, or, or improve the design. Um, in more or less five months from now, uh, we're planning to have a stable release, at which point we will recommend that Fedora Core OS is ready to run in production. Um, so specifically, what's next? Um, we need to finish implementing the uh, all three of the streams that I mentioned. Uh, we're working on adding additional cloud and vert platforms, uh, support for architectures other than x86, uh, live Pixie support that I mentioned also uh, uh, earlier, also live CDs. Um, some work around network configuration, uh, additional sugar for the config transpiler. Uh, machine counting right now is actually only a stub. It reads the config file and makes sure that it's valid so that you can configure your nodes, uh, but it doesn't do anything yet. We will have much more documentation, and we are also working on um, some details around integration with OKD and Kubernetes generally. Um, this is worth calling out specifically because uh, the OKD4 effort is getting spun up at the same time. Um, in the short term, the plan there is to essentially branch Fedora Core OS and bolt in whatever needs to be bolted in just to get OKD to uh, a minimally working state to have a demo. Um, after that, we will start working on integrating that OKD work back into Fedora Core OS. So there's one distro uh, that's used for OKD use cases, uh, for uh, other Kubernetes distros, as well as for um, non-Kubernetes use cases. Uh, and I listed there a couple of the, of the open issues in order to make that happen. Um, finally, a note on the, uh, the distros that we came from. Fedora Atomic Host will, uh, has not updated Fedora 30 and uh, we'll go end of life late in November or so, uh, depending on Fedora schedules. Container Linux will continue to be maintained. 
uh, for about six months after the stable release of Fedora Core OS, and we will announce exact timing when we get closer to that point. Um, for container Linux users, we'll provide migration tools and docs and as much help as we can to help people migrate their existing workloads from container Linux over to Fedora Core OS. Um, here's the usual list of places you can go. Uh, the, the website is the download site. It also links to the Getting Started Guide. Um, the second link is uh, essentially the focus of development for Fedora Core OS. And then there's some other places you can discuss uh, Fedora Core OS with us as well. Thank you very much. Uh, looks like we have about two minutes left. We can maybe take a question or two, and then I think both of us will be available outside after the talk. Thanks. Um, my question's about what updating and releasing Fedora Core OS will look like. So do you plan on releasing, like a, for Amazon's case, regular AMIs, and then if I wanted to update Fedora, so uh, just, and how, how, uh, how uh, often will you release those AMIs? Um, I'm, I'm hearing nod, so that means often. Sure. So um, the current plan, the exact timing is subject to some change, but all three streams will release at least every two weeks. Um, in addition to those scheduled releases, we can have out-of-cycle releases. So if there's some major security update that needs to go out immediately, uh, we'll do a special re releases on all three channels for that. And that will be for that will be an update payload, and it will also be new AMIs, new QMU images, everything. Okay, so you plan to release the OS trees and the, the image builds at the same time. Yes. Perfect. Yeah. So you mentioned towards the end of that about OKD and the integration of this. When you say by branching uh, FCOS for this, do you mean specifically like there's going to be a separate um, OS tree stream and a separate image stream for this? Or is there going to be like some kind of overlay, pa package overlay or container overlay? What do you mean by that? Because that's, that's kind of confusing, especially... I came from just hearing the Silver Bull talk, and he was talking about all kinds of weird things you can do um, on top of the RPM OS tree core for this. We don't actually know right now. Uh, it may be a separate OS tree. It may That was, I think, what we were talking about at first. Then we started talking about just doing package overlays. Um, the latter approach is cleaner because the, it requires less extra stuff. Um, we want to go for the smallest possible branch. Not clear what that's going to be yet. Two quick, 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 quick questions. One, uh, automatic updates. Isn't that going to destroy custom things? Second question, um, if you add all the bug fixes to stable, how does that keep it stable? Right. Um, so to the first question, if you have customizations in Etsy or you have something in Opt, for example, that will not be destroyed by an upgrade. Uh, the parts of, an, of the system which are modified by an upgrade are read-only. So you can't accidentally get yourself in trouble there. Um, and the second question, sorry, remind me. Uh, uh, how do you keep it stable if you're adding all the bug fixes to stable? How, how does that make Carefully. It stable? Um, <laughs> so it's a tough call. We've been dealing with, with this with, on con the container Linux side for several years. It's a tough call. Uh, if there's something which is a large change and probably not that urgent, we would roll it through testing first. If there's a change which is small and urgent, we would probably send it direct to stable. If there's a change like fixing Spectre and Meltdown, which is important and also a giant patch series, we may have to hold our nose and send it directly to stable. And that's not ideal, but it's a judgment call. I would suggest having the test and then stable. Yeah, we will. Yeah, we'll do that when we feel we have to, but with security updates and really critical bugs, there's just there's a judgment call sometimes. Anything else? Cool. Cool. Thank you very much. Thanks.